As I have been introduced, my name is Bokamu uh, uh, I'm from Duke Standard, the Department of Electrical, Computer, and Telecommunication Engineering. And I'm the group leader of a research group called Signal Processing Networks and Systems. And I have uh, one of my our members here, Professor Chuma, he's also a part of the project as the administrative coordinator. Um, I'll be presenting to you this proposal uh, the project itself, or what it entails. Um, before I continue, allow me to sell the essence of the project. If you look at the logo of the project, you have Botswana set and you have a tree and a satellite hovering over it. We know that back in the days, our forefathers, they sat under the trees and discussed engineering and science projects, but they never went to school. They built bridges and they did wonders through negotiations, through collaborations, whether or not, whether seeing eye to eye, but they still managed. Um, allow me now, can you, okay. okay. Now let me introduce to you what is a satellite, but specifically I'm going to talk about what is called a cube satellite. This is the exact size of a cube satellite. This small thing here has opened doors to universities and governments to participate in what you call the space race. And this is actually what we are trying to build. This is called a one unit or one U cube satellite. Inside it, is, it will be stuffed with electronics and what you call the payloads. So the payload up there it can be a camera, it can be a transponder, de depending on the mission of the project. And then you will have other electronic components, being the altitude controlling systems. So when the satellite is orbiting around the Earth, as you can see down there, you need to keep it in, uh, on that, uh, in that orbit. So you need to do the alti uh, altitude control. And then communication, you need to send the data back to Earth for consumption. We also have the solar panels that will be harvesting uh, solar energy for using it because you know you cannot use electricity there. Then you have to have, uh, use renewable energy that is readily available in space. And then you've got antennas which will be now communicating with what you call the ground station. So this is the ground station. This will be located on the ground. Allow me again to even also express some of the concepts in Sitswana. Most of us, we call this satellite. The satellite is the whole system. And in technology, most of the time, we'll prefer to call that a spacecraft. This will be a ground station. And then this ground station will be linked to uh, end user uh, equipment. In our case, we'll have uh, computers and storage uh, devices. So basically, this is what we are trying to say. We will be developing the spacecraft, the ground station, and you will have also to design and model the orbits that is going to be transversed by this spacecraft. Now, the, the project objectives, the mission of the project, we are aiming to address the challenges in agriculture and tourism. So during the course of this presentation, I will lean towards agriculture, but you'll find that most of the applications are readily applicable to tourism. Uh, so one of the first objectives is to design a CubeSat. We will design it in-house in Beast. I admit that we have lack of facilities so some of the things we'll outsource them, we will have to travel and do some testing somewhere else because we really need laboratories that, we have, that have to be certified. We will also train students. We will keep the students with the skills to develop this satellite from ground zero up to launch. So they will be involved in all the processes. And then we have to develop what you call the space framework, uh, uh, the space program frameworks to be uh, in uh, uh, instituted in our curriculum. Also, we will generate useful data for use that will be satellite uh, data. Again, there's minimal usage of uh, satellite data in Botswana. We will take this opportunity to make a lot of uh, emphasis on this. We will make workshops, call conferences, go around the country, make sure that the students, the universities, the government, the uh, private entities come on board and consume this data. It is very useful. Again, 
we will develop what you call a state-of-the-art research prototype. Most of the gadgets that we are going to use to develop this are readily available in the market, and by rule of thumb, you cannot launch a satellite that is not certified. So all those products are already certified, they've gone through lots of tests. So alongside that, we will develop our own prototypes. So in the future, we will, should be able to now test this satellite as part of a payload for scientific applications. So that's the only way to enter into this uh, industry. And again, once you start a project of this magnitude, you are triggering what you call collaborations in all domains, locally, regionally, and internationally. We hope that all of us who are in this room and the nation at large will come on board and participate in this project. We have already initiated some collaboration with some international universities and companies. One, I know the question that is now we are pondering over, what can this small thing do? Imagine if you lose a key to your house. That tree, when you see at it, when you look at it, that's a mustard tree. Have you ever looked at the size of the seed? It's very small. That's why we're going to start. Now, we intend to do the three units, the three U. So three U is taking three of this uh, one U, one unit keep satellites. The reason being is that we are looking at an emission that is has to do with Earth observation, so we need to put a, a camera as a payload. So the optics of the camera will occupy one half of the whole satellite, and the rest of the space will be occupied by the electronics. So in future missions, we hope we will get support, continued support from government and uh, private institutions. We hope to even go to 6U and 12U, because the more uh, components you can put on the satellite, the lot you can achieve through that. Again, the advantages of cube satellites. The conventional satellites that we are seeing right now, the ones you use for DSTVs, those are very expensive. If we are to do risk mitigation, it's best to start by learning how to crawl. We will walk and we will run at some point in time. It is affordable. Under 10 million pula, you can launch this, given that you're already having such facilities already in place. You can launch this. But if you are to start from afresh, we're talking of a few more magnitudes of millions of pullers. But the benefits are very enormous. Independence, we really need to be uh, in control of our our space. What I mean by that is, I'm going to give you one example. Our governments, I know, are participating in the international conferences. China, right now, they are developing a digital currency. And they can, once they make sure that everybody uses that digital currency, and most of the technologies that they apply will be blockchain, some of the transactions will happen globally. And if you are still the end users or the residents in the satellites, they can do whatever they want with that. We should have our own interface to our own space. Um, reduce the development times. As I said, if again, now you are well established, you can do this in eight months and launch it. But if you are going to start from afresh, the recommended timeline is uh, three years by NASA. Data securities, we've got risk reduction, because again, you can deploy a, a, a number of this and create what you call a constellation, have backups to send data. One satellite will be failing, you will still have a fallback uh, option. Now, again, when it talks about risk reduction, we will start with a very cheap way of uh, attaining the, uh, participating in space uh, race, but if you look down there, I'm giving you three uh, cases of satellites. The first one costed 400 million US dollars. That's a conventional satellite uh, it, it belonging to United Emirates. It failed during the uh, launch. 
So imagine the amount of uh, funds or finance that you are losing out of that. And also the Russian, even though they are the f some of the first to participate in this, they are still failing. There's the weather station, it got lost. Why? Because the launch, the launching, site, uh, uh, the launching pad coordinates were not well captured. So that's a human error. We've got the Ugen 33 satellite of the China, from China. It's never reported about its whereabouts. So we are saying, let's at least invest in this and see how we can do. Even if it fails, we will remain with what you call the human capital. The knowledge will still remain. But the risk has been reduced already. Applications of satellites, or what keep satellites can do. We can move from communication and IoT and Earth observation. This is where the mission will be. Uh, uh, we will do Earth observation. So we'll take pictures of uh, the Earth surface and send back to Earth. Also, we are looking at it from the point of scientific application. That means we have to show that we really have what you call demonstrations of uh, on, on capabilities of uh, doing a satellite by ourselves. You can do, do geolocation and logistics, signal monitoring. For example, you can monitor the earthquake signals and respond well in time. Some of the applications that are now trending, the digital globe uh, is providing Uber with a, what you call 30 centimeter resolution. So if you look at that figure, it's a 30 centimeter resolution image. You can, when I say 30 centimeter, one pixel is 30 centimeter. So you can even see the road markings. The time we acquire what you call self-driving cars, you need to be always up to date with all these changes that are going on within the city. Every day you come to Aboroni, there's a, some development going on. So if you imagine have self-driving cars, it's not well informed, what will happen? Accidents. And during the lockdown, while we were in our rooms, SpaceX launched up more than 100 satellites to do with the Starlink project, that is to provide internet. And I know the astronomers can now see it. They are complaining about the constellation is visible on the, in the skyline. The owner of this project here, sorry for that. The owner of this project, Elon Musk, recently tried to launch a Starship going uh, to, to demonstrate the, the Starship that is going, supposed to go to Mars uh, a few years from now. And to demonstrate its, uh, its landing, it crashed. What he said, because people were throwing uh, negative comments to him. He just tweeted immediately, he said, Mas, here we come. I want us to have that positivity. So the impact of this project, we know we have the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which are cascaded down even up to the HRDC, NDP 11, Botswana Vision 2036. It also been adopted by the AU Agenda 2063 and the STISA 2024. Some of these goals, we are going to achieve them. And you are saying we are going to contribute to about 12 of those. You can imagine, no poverty. If you can have a system that can recommend to you that uh, you are going to have about uh, amount of this uh, amount of harvest, then prepare for uh, supply, supplies so that you can sell outside or prepare for shortage so that you can import uh, well in advance. So we can do a lot with that system. Quality education, gender equality, part of the project, we are not just going to sit back and involve only gentlemen. We have a ratio of gentlemen to ladies also. Um, so the, in, in the technical, uh, technology or telecommunication arena, we have what we call the 6G research and development. We know that 5G has been launched in other countries. Right now we are collaborating with the University of Oul in Finland. They are working on 6G flagship. They are the one who are housing that. 
um, we are seeing these people, if you look at the economic benefits, is very uh, impressive. So we are saying we have learned some of, through the hard times, especially what, during the COVID-19 pandemic. When borders were shut, when aircrafts were grounded, our tourism industry was in struggle. What about the food supplies we get from South Africa and other neighboring countries? So we need to go back and make sure that we revive our ag agricultural industry and the tourism industry. We can maybe offer what you call visual tourism. That will be lovely. Now going forward, I'm saying, I'm appealing to the government, the private sector, and all other institutions to aggressively invest in research development and innovation. And the government is showing its commitment through this project. Just to give you a snapshot of what is happening around the world, some people might say, oh, we can get free data from somewhere else. I'll be telling you that if you do that, you are simply selling jobs to other countries. You are telling me any student or any of our kids who's interested in space technology, for him to be in a good position to participate in that industry, they need to relocate. Are we saying that? I say no. Look at Africa. All the countries that are painted blue, they have satellites, and you see numbers marked on them. Africa. South Africa has got about four satellites. Next year, they'll be launching more satellites. Together with Angola, Tunisia, and Egypt, and Botswana, we are still here. Yes, we will build a business case out of this, but I'm appealing to you, let's appreciate this. 1956, the first satellite was launched. Now, people never thought of its uh, impact on the world. Africa is sitting at 0.9%, the number of satellites, especially the nano satellites or the cube satellites that are being owned. So we are talking of first world countries. We want to go from middle income to high income. So these are some of the things that we have to look at. These are the indicators telling us that something is not being done right. We need to ignite or initiate new uh, industries. And space technology is one of those. I talked about implementing a 3U satellite. There's a reason for that. It's not just because of interest. You can see, because of its performance, the space it, uh, it offers, and all other advantages. That is why most of the satellites that are being uh, launched by the first uh, uh, implementers is the 3U cube satellite. Our fallback, if at all we lack in terms of funds, will be the 1U. Now, the projections of satellites that are going to be launched are there. We see that this year it was estimated that about 343 will be launched. In total, that's around 437. Some were delayed because of the COVID pandemic, and we see 435 expected next year. How about 2022 and 2023? Can we be part of those? I say yes, if we do everything collaboratively, giving support to each other. It's not only about sending a satellite to space. Look at the number of companies created ever since the launch of nanosatellites. We missed this peak. We missed it. But I'm telling you, according to projection, there's another peak coming. Can we reap the benefits of that? I said, yes, we can. Now, the common methodology of uh, harvesting the data or consuming this data, we'll have the data and we'll have the engineers sitting there doing the software and systems engineering. They will do all the statistics and measurements, models, knowledge and expertise will be applied. And on the other side, you will have models that are readily available to instill insights. We'll have well-informed decision-making. Imagine right now there are some torrential rainfalls up in the north. There's a locust coming this way. We don't know where they are. 
we could be responding well in time before these things happen because of these images. Now, I'm just going to, because I told you I'm going to lean towards agriculture, you can really see some of the uh, uh, applications. If you look to the far left there, you see tractor race. We can monitor whether you are we can monitor the biomass estimation crop special heterogeneity. At the bottom there, you see a paddock farm, some parts in being in red, some in being in green. The green is just telling you that after you do all this machine learning algorithms, running all this and you get inside, now the computer is telling you, okay, the green patches there, you can now take your cattle and go and feed them from there. The red zones, it's either you have chemicals still active or maybe the crops are still growing, so wait a minute. So, the impact on agriculture is, it, it, it starts even from crop choice. We can determine whether this crop is performing better, maybe in Pandamatenga or in Borolong farms. So we will have recommended lists of seeds to distribute across the country. Cultivation, precision farming, and then we also have harvest. You can predict how much harvest you're going to get, and then plan well in time on storage and logistics, we can say, no, let's close the borders well in time because those are very, peri uh, very uh, perishable goods. So we should have this kind of well-informed decision making. And then it cascades down to business management until it reaches the market. There's a lot. There's a plethora of benefits out of satellite technology. There's a lot. Food security, indigenous knowledge. If we can instill some of this knowledge in our algorithms, we can separate ourselves from the first world countries. If we, have, we can capture that resolution and instill it in our algorithms, we can separate ourselves from them. Global markets penetration, applied research. We are talking of quality education, knowledge-based economy. I mean, the list is endless. I just put a few. I know you can jot more down. Now, the approach or the business process model. First of all, the first six months, we will do what you call the feasibility study. Okay, from the research point of view, we are done. Just because this is a national project, now we have to make sure that the nation appreciates what we are really doing. We are giving ourselves six months to do that. And then we also, during that six months, we have to sit down with all the relevant stakeholders, do what you call uh, uh, system requirements and uh, get the, 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 the anticipations of, out of this project so that we can have those as inputs to our, our project. And we'll have cross-sectoral and uh, collaborations for uh, implementing the project. Out of the project, we are going to have new technological solutions for agriculture and tourism industry. We will have short-term and long-term uh, impacts. For example, the short-term impact, we will have uh, research publication, research prototypes that will be released. Within, when I say short-term, I mean two to three years from now. And the long-term, you are talking about knowledge-based economy. Because throughout all these processes, training and knowledge, uh, knowledge transfer will be active. So this is the timeline of Botswana Set 1 project. We will start with the mission definition. As I say, we have to do consultative meetings with the stakeholders. And then do what you call intensive training. We will adopt some of the modules that we are already teaching. And we will also bring modules from the industry, like integration of these components, campaign, testing of this vibrational test or environmental test, because this cube satellite will be orbiting in a thermosphere with harsh conditions. So we have to make sure that it qualifies to be there. So our students need to be well equipped with those skills of testing and producing reports 
to institutions like NASA, those who own the spacecraft. And then we'll go to the next phase of uh, satellite development. And finally, we will launch it in three years. We are hoping to do this under two years if all the support is given to us, especially from all the ministries and the stakeholders involved. So that's blue box there, that's Botswana set one. We'll do the feasibility studies. While we do the feasibility studies, we do all the consultation, do subsystem design simulation. 2022, we have to do the training on, the, now the hands-on training on the system, come up with the prototype flight model, do what you call the functional electrical testing, and finally, before you even launch, the launcher, for example, we don't have a launch pad. That's one of the questions that I normally get across here. We don't have a launch pad, it's very expensive to acquire it, and it's not economically advisable to start with a launch pad. You have to take it somewhere else and launch it from there. So before they accept this, it has to pass the final health check. They are also going to do checks, or you will have to produce uh, certificates from uh, certified laboratories. And finally, 20, between 2022 and 2023, we will launch this satellite, hopefully. I have seen some countries doing that in Africa. 2024 to 2025, we hope to embark on other new missions. I hope we will have attracted more interest in this uh, technology, uh, space technology. And we are saying 10 plus BW space presence, if you look at behind your jackets. We hope that we will get support to participate in this kind of missions for the next 10 years and more. We are trying to align it to the UNDP SDGs, align it to the uh, telecommunications uh, research uh, and development uh, activities like the 6G. So once we reach 10 years, we have to sit down, go back to the drawing tables and address new challenges. So what are the deliverables? So to read done, we have to commit ourselves. For the first year, feasibility study report has to be given back to the government after six months. The stakeholder consultations, we have to show evidence that we have consulted everyone. Business case report, the mission definition, and we show also trained researchers. Frequency slot uh, uh, application should be done. The ground station design and the site identification. Satellite model, we should have a small uh, model on a breadboard. Year two, we have to implement the ground station. Prototype flight model, do all the tests. Start to do publication in high ranking journals. Hold conferences and workshops so that the nation at large and the world knows that we are doing something. And then the final year, aiming to go to a launch, we do the final checks reports, uh, also more publications, and we expect to get more than five graduates out of this from, with masters and PhD. And then we will have what you call the satellite training program housed induced and can be distributed to other universities. Are we going to do this alone? No. If you really want to be the best, you have to work with the best. If you compete with the best and you don't have the financial muscles, the knowledge and all everything, you will fail. Collaborate. So our sponsor, Botswana government has given his commitment to sponsor this project through the Ministry of Tertiary Education, Research and Science and Technology. We have the first collaborator, the University of All that I have mentioned. We have the MOU and MOU with them. Um, they're already having one of our students is doing PhD there. They're offering you free uh, tuition fees. And you get access to all the facilities. They have got the 5G network in their labs, they've got the uh, access to Nokia infrastructure. We've got the Afconset network. 
That's the African Constellation Satellite Network. We are a, a part of, we are a member of that team. The aim is to bring 10 African countries to develop their own satellites. So we are sharing knowledge through that. One of the countries that is leading this is Ghana, and one of the leading engineers there was working for NASA. He's coming back to Africa and instill knowledge to other African countries. We have the Signal Processing and Networks Research Group based in Lafra University. That's why I schooled. They do advanced signal processing algorithms, so in terms of algorithms, we are also covered. We have the Loon, this is a private company in the USA that operating what you call the stratosphere communication uh, gadget. It's more like a satellite. You know the hot air balloon? So they pump it, it will be flying over your country and providing internet or GSM uh, services, you name a lot. We've got the National Astronomy Research Institute of uh, Astronomical Institute of Thailand, Narit. I have two master students who went there for attachment. They are not even bringing them back. They have given a, them extra one year because the, their performance is very impressive. So right now they are dealing in a 40 meter dish telescope to observe uh, the stars. So I would like to end by saying thank you and I hope the story about the tree Hota, Morero, Bukopano, we will achieve a lot. Let's use technology for good. Let's conquer the world with food. And again, let's preserve what God has given us, the natural resources. Happy holidays. Thank you.